So before I actually make the introduction uh, here, I want to tell you what kind of person in coming to the stage. Uh, the year is 2014, so count uh, 20 years back, someone similar won a Golden Globe and she won it for uh, something called, uh, a movie called What Women Want. So I'd like to present the next speaker via photo first. Uh, <laughs> And now I'd like to invite uh, what I think is a real life uh, similar. So, Dafina, would you kindly step up to the stage, please? Everybody say. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Thank okay. you. Okay. Please have a seat. So, I've never done this, and I told you I haven't done this. And I, uh, uh, or I haven't done the fireside chat exercise. So I got some we'll lessons practice. from you uh, earlier. So I don't know, tell us, um, when did you get in? When did you arrive to uh, Sofia? Uh, first of all, thank you all for being here. It's a pleasure to meet so many Bulgarian entrepreneurs uh, and just Eastern Europeans. I haven't been here in Bulgaria for a long time, almost six years. And uh, a lot has changed. Um, I'm really happy to, uh, to, to meet so many of you. I arrived on Monday night and uh, for the past uh, four days now, uh, my experiences have only gotten better. And of course, this is the, the culmination of it all. Uh, so thank you. I, I look forward to talking to all of you. I look forward to your questions and uh, to helping in any way I can. So you're from Bulgaria. Yes. And uh, you've been now here. Uh, you've, you've, you've had a, how did we say it last night? You had a six. Uh, six, six. You're, you've been traveling to six countries, and now you're here for six days. That's right. And uh, tell us a little bit of how. Um, now you live in San Francisco, but you're Bulgarian. So how did this start? You, where did you, where were you born, and mm -hmm. where did you grow up? So uh, I was born in Pazarjik, a small town uh, in Bulgaria. Uh, moved to Haskovo, so lived half of, I guess. Uh, from the time I was in Bulgaria, half the time was spent in Pazerzy, half of it was spent in Hasko. And uh, I spent a lot of my time actually also in a little village called Debrštice, right outside of Pazerzy, uh, where my grandmother and my grandfather grew tobacco. So uh, for the Bulgarians in the room, um, I'm proud to say I'm Selenka. <laughs> uh, I, uh, I, uh, I know how to nizhut <laughs> tun. And uh, I think that some of the best lessons I've learned in my life come from that, those, th those days. The days when I uh, grew up uh, in the little village, uh, when I was walking around barefoot all day long and uh, uh, spending all my time with my fellow Bulgarian friends and grandmothers uh, and just learning from them. So I do, yeah, I do live in San Francisco today. Uh, I moved to the, uh, to, to the United States when I was 18. Uh, for for college, and I really never left the United States. Uh, I uh, I've been working in the United States for now almost 10 years, and I have been very fortunate and very lucky to uh, be an investor to work for a venture capital firm, and uh, I have been in the venture capital industry for five years. My firm is called U.S. Venture Partners, 30-year-old firm. Uh, it's in the Bay Area on Sand Hill Road, where most venture capital firms are. The place is known as being one of the most expensive uh, real estate in, in, in the world uh, per square foot. Uh, so that's where I am today, yes. So we have our homegrown Pazarjik originated tobacco picking uh, Sand Hill right. Road venture capitalist. Thank you very much. That's right. <laughs> <Thank> <laughs> um, let's, let's try to drill into this. What, what do you actually do? What, what do you get up and what do you do? I mean, what, how does a day go yeah. and tell, you just tell us a little bit more. I have one of the best jobs in the world, I think. I, I feel very fortunate and very happy to, uh, to work for a venture capital firm because it puts me in front of people like you, people with great ideas that I can learn from every day, uh, people who are very uh, excited to build something interesting, something new and uh, change, change their environment 
uh, in a way they can. So how does the typical day look? There is no typical day, and that's one of the, uh, probably one of the biggest attractions of my job. Uh, I spend most of my day meeting, meeting people, uh, people who have entrepreneurs, who have ideas uh, for products or services. My focus is on software, enterprise software, and enterprise applications in particular. And uh, uh, the, a typical day for me is five or six meetings, hearing uh, presentations, talking to uh, the teams, evaluating ideas, and making investment decisions. Usually, I would see about um, between 10 to 20 companies a week in person. I'll probably hear from at least that many more uh, over email. I make one or two investments a year. So from about a thousand companies or more that, that I see every year, I, it's my job to pick no more than one or two to make an investment in. So my job has, uh, ha has to do with a lot of learning, uh, a lot of talking, and, uh, uh, and, and some analysis, analysis of new market opportunities, uh, opportunities to uh, make money for the investors that have uh, put uh, their money in, uh, in my hands, in the hands of my firm. Okay, and you said you haven't been here, I think, six years. Uh, it's the first trip to Bulgaria in six years. How do you find it? How do you, what, what, like, uh, apart from the fact that apparently we had a great dinner last night, and that's <laughs> uh, um, how do you, like, walking around and, and talking to people, um, and I also believe you had a chance to uh, hear um, six five-minute uh, presentations yesterday, more or less randomly picked, but six yeah. local startups. Right. Um, and I think a lot of people are here today because they want to um, kind of get close to that uh, stage where they can go in London or San Francisco or any other place and pitch and get noticed and get invited and hopefully get funded one day. W looking at you know, coming back here after six years and looking at these six yeah. people that you knew nothing about before, so it was your first yeah. um, kind of you parachuted into yeah. the Bulgarian startup scene. How, uh, how did you? How, how did you? What was your reaction? How did you feel? Yeah. Was like, oh, not so good, or was it wow, some interesting stuff? So, I, I haven't been here in a while, but I, I have been talking to Bulgarian entrepreneurs consistently. Uh, uh, luckily, they find me, and I'm very happy to hear from people who are trying to start companies, Bulgarians who are trying to start companies here or in the United States. So uh, I have been in constant interaction in a way with the community, uh, even though I haven't been in the country. Uh, that being said, I've been really pleasantly surprised by my experience so far, uh, both at large uh, with uh, the service providers in the country, uh, all the way from the uh, airline, I, I flew Bulgarian Air, of course, uh, to the, the the cab driver, to the, the the people in the in the hotel room, I think the quality of service has really uh, increased, uh, and I can say that as someone who who has uh, not interacted with Bulgarian-based service providers for at least six years. Now, on the entrepreneurial side, um, I think Bulgaria has a real edge. Uh, we have an incredibly talented pool of people uh, who have the opportunity to start companies. I, I think that uh, there is a misperception mis uh, which I'd like to address here, which is that Bulgaria is a small market and that there aren't enough people and that's why we can't start companies here. I don't think that's true. And uh, I think the best thing to do is to look for examples that are already working successfully and a great example is Israel. Israel is uh, pretty much the same size as, uh, as Bulgaria in terms of population. Uh, they are just as limited geographically, I would say, as Bulgaria is. Yet Israel has had an incredible amount of success, an incredible level of successful companies. Just last year, Israel had five startups, software startups alone, being sold for an aggregate of over $2 billion. Um, USVP, my firm, was very fortunate to make money in one of those transactions. USVP had invested in a company called Trustier. We invested $5 million in the company uh, for 25% ownership. Uh, we were the only institutional investors because the company being started by Israelis was very scrappy. Uh, they 
uh, did not assume that capital is available to them. So they tried to, uh, or will always be there for them. So they tried to get customers right away, uh, get into revenue generating mode. And within four years, they reached 60 million in sales uh, a year, yearly sales. And they sold last year to IBM for over $650 million. So it was a great payday for the entrepreneurs. They deserved it. We were very happy for them. I think Bulgaria can have similar success stories. Um, I think we just need to think about what, what is our unique advantage here. Israelis have um, security as their unique advantage. As you know, they have, a, a very, um, they have an outstanding military service that has for a long time uh, done innovations in the security sector. Uh, they take that outside of the military and uh, commercialize those technologies. Bulgaria has strong talent pool, and I think we have uh, very creative and innovative people here. So I think it's just a matter of time to have uh, a story similar to uh, Trustier come out of Bulgaria. And that's why it's so gratifying for me to meet people like Pavel, meet people like the guys you introduced me to last night, six startups all um, being formed here in Bulgaria by Bulgarian teams that are doing some really innovative things and using their own unique experiences, their, uh, their talents to put together offerings that, that appeal to a certain, number, a certain customer set, customer base. And um, again, I, as I said, I, I've been very impressed and really happy to, to see that happening here. Um, I think we met first time maybe six or seven years ago and it was a cold meeting. You didn't know me and I didn't know you, but we kind of uh, kept in touch over the, over the years. In these years, what, what can you tell us about um, maybe the most interesting project that you funded? How, how, how did it happen step by step and some outcome? Yeah. Just like the Israeli example, maybe, but something that was your baby. So uh, I've been in venture for five and a half years, since 2008. Uh, and. Uh, I would say that all the good things in life, at least for me, uh, have been a, very much a combination of uh, hard work, but also a lot of luck. And uh, I always thank my lucky stars for, for, the, for all the blessings that I've had and that I continue to have in my life. So I, I think venture capital found me it, uh, as a job. I was introduced through school, through my school. I, 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 uh, I was taking my MBA. Uh, at Stanford and I was taking a class on entrepreneurship. As part of that class, I was uh, asked to meet a venture capitalist and convince them of my idea of my project for that class. I was introduced to the managing partner of Venrock and that's where you and I met, yep. we met at Venrock. Venrock is one of the oldest venture firms in the Valley. It was started by the Rockefellers, uh, which you know are uh, among the richest families in the world. And they were investing, they still invest in software and healthcare companies. And I was introduced to Ray and uh, um, a couple of months after we met, he called me and he asked me if I had plans for after business school. Uh, one thing led to another and I started working for, for him right away. And uh, uh, he promised to teach me everything he knew about venture capital and he believed that venture capital was an apprenticeship business and you learn the best by watching. So. Uh, he took me with him to every board meeting he went to, every meeting in general, every uh, company that he looked at and considered for investment, uh, I was part of that. And so I learned a lot from him uh, in that process, but he also gave me um, opportunities to, uh, to step up and, and, uh, and experiment myself. And uh, when I was at Venerock, for the two years I was there, I made three investments with his support and the support of the rest of the team. And the, the one company that I'm probably um, most excited about uh, fr from that time and I was only at that time for a, a less than a year on the job so that's why I'm saying luck is so important in life in general but, but especially in the in the industry I'm in um, I, I would say that you know after nine months on the job you probably no matter what the job is you can say that you're an expert uh, and I had um, met um, I, I met a couple of entrepreneurs uh, Matthew Prince and Michelle Zatlin from Harvard Business School. They had just graduated uh, school. Uh, they're, 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 uh, he'd finished their master's. And a, a Bulgarian friend of mine, who was a classmate of theirs, said to me casually, hey, you know, I think they're building a security company. And you know, you're looking at security companies. So why don't you talk to them? Um, and I thought, great, I'll, I'll meet them. Uh, and uh, uh, we, we spent 
months building a relationship, getting to know each other. And my firm really didn't want to invest in that company because it was only two founders. They were both very young. Neither of them had any expertise in what they were building. You know, security software usually takes a lot of deep te technological background, understanding of the customer base. Uh, so, so venture firms try to back entrepreneurs who have done it before, who have proven that they understand how to execute. And here there were two 30-year-olds that had, had an idea. They didn't even have a one line of code written. They didn't even have a pitch. They didn't have a presentation put together. And so the firm just didn't even want to consider it. So we spent three or four months together, the, the, the two founders, who are exceptional, who are exceptional. And I think Matthew, since he has presented yeah. to this, uh, to, to this audience last, last year. year. Yep. Um, but um, Matthew and Michelle um, really clearly articulated their vision. Uh, and they were wrong about almost everything. But they were very <laughs> convincing, to, to me at least. And uh, over time, they, became very, they were very convincing to, uh, they were convincing to the firm as well. They, um, uh, so they're building a, basically a, a proxy for websites to, pr uh, to prevent uh, attacks. They route all traffic to the website through their proxy service. And uh, uh, by having built a database of all malicious IP addresses, they uh, make a decision on whether to uh, let the request come in or be dropped out. And they, they believe that they could, by doing that, they could uh, re uh, rebuild Akamai, essentially become the, the new backbone of the modern internet. And so it's a big idea, very, very uh, ambitious idea coming from two people. But after six months of grinding on my team, together with those, those two founders, we convinced the company, Venrock, to invest in them. And they were just two people, so we only invested a million dollars, a little over a million dollars. And uh, just like happens in most of these cases, we bought sufficient ownership to justify the investment. And really what happened was uh, my, my, my boss, Ray, I think behind closed doors told, told the, the team, the founders, uh, the, I'm sorry, the partners of the firm, he said, look, I know you guys don't believe anything will happen, and probably you're right, nothing will happen out of this company, <laughs> but you know what, she's been working on it really hard, and it's only a million bucks, who cares, it's a $600 million fund. A million dollars is, you know, what one of you spends on travel and, and whatever, and you know, the firm spends on travel and, uh, uh, and entertainment for a year or half a year, so we can, you know, we can we can just make that investment, even if it's just marketing dollars that we're spending, and that became the most successful investment that Venrock has made in the last five years you know, on the technology side. The company went on to, and one of the uh, Maria is right there. She's, uh, uh, I'm very proud to say that she's uh, director of business development at that company, another Bulgarian. Um, the, the company, and she can speak to the company's uh, opportunity and, and their success so far better than me. But the company has become one of the, mo as an investor, I can say one of the most successful investments that Venerok has made. Um, I can't speak to the valuation. It's, this is private information, but I would say that, um, you know. Uh, probably well over, for Vendor has been pr probably well over 50x, maybe even 100x at this point. So um, here, here is an example of how um, you know, an investment was made. And people ask me all the time, how do you make decisions? And you know, I can give you the formula. I can tell you we look at markets, we look at teams, we look at product offering and competition. And we analyze everything there is to analyze. We look at all the data. The more data, the better, usually. But then there is so much also luck and, uh, in, the, in the entire process. Luck for me, luck for them as well, um, that, that uh, uh, almost negates the entire, the entire process. And uh, you know, sometimes you just have to really strongly believe that you, you have a team in front of you that can execute and that they can figure it out. And you don't know what it is that they're trying to figure out, but you're betting on the team, especially that early. And this company has been still one of the most successful investments that I have been involved with. And I'm very, I'm very proud of them and very happy for them, I think they will be, um, in the future, an even bigger success story for the Valley, and I probably, probably globally as well. And um, thank you. If you go back and uh, consider, um, I assume you probably had more than one of these cases in, in the, in the, fi in the s almost six years you've been doing this. What are consistently the couple of things that end up being in place for this success to happen? What, what about maybe yeah. about the person or the team? The, the, like what is the one thing that stands out that was always the case? Or is there such thing? Well, I have only been doing it for five years, so I don't know if I have enough data points to draw big conclusions from it. But we're all biased by I guess, the experiences we have. And so 
And I would say, so I would say that from my experience, professional experience, as well as personal experience, I would say that um, the team is the most important thing. Um, all the founders that I have backed, that, or, or my team, my partners have backed, have all shared um, an incredible drive, a uh, very strong work ethic, and they have all been very good at sales and marketing. Um, they, they've, they've been very good at selling their idea, they're convincing, they're uh, inspirational. And I, I think that's incredibly important because when you think about what a CEO does, all they do is they sell, 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 they sell to three entities, they sell to their employees, they sell to their customers, and they sell to their investors. So that's all they have to be really good at is selling an idea. And uh, um, I have seen many CEOs who are very good at technologists, who have been very good at building the right technology, but without sales and marketing expertise, without the ability to translate that, that offering into a great story that appeals to people, that someone buys because of the promise of what it can deliver, it's almost impossible to succeed. And I would say that the, the, the best CEOs that we have had have been also the best sales, salesmen. So I'm an engineer and um, I, I, I grew up as an engineer. I, I, I loved math and sciences when I was little. I think that helped me get into school, into one of the best colleges in the United States. And uh, so I was always biased that engineers are the ones that build the world, you know, that's where the real value is, you, you build the technology. And I sort of always dismissed the sales and marketing people as, oh, you know, they're, sort of, they're just the guys who do all the talking, but none of the doing. Well, my job has taught me that uh, they're the, they really are the true revenue engine of the company. They're the ones that make it all happen. And you can have a company that has mediocre technology, but has the best salespeople, and that company more often than not will succeed and will um, beat in the market a company that has superior technology, however inferior sales and marketing execution. And so from that standpoint, and I know that in Bulgaria we have great technologists, I would say to all of you who are building companies, thinking about and, and are focusing uh, exclusively almost on your, um, uh, on your product, think a lot about who you bring in to, to, to drive sales and marketing because that will be ultimately what makes or breaks the company. And um, I think I have time, I'm full of questions, but I'm also sure you guys are full of questions. But um, what, what is it that you don't have time personally to do? Just now going back to Dafina. Oh. Uh, what, how, how's your life evolved? Like, what is it that you don't have time to do? Because clearly you've done a lot of things and you are. Yeah. But what is it the things that you want to have time to do? I don't have time to read. Um, I, I wish I had more time to read. Uh, most of the mo most of the stuff that I read is uh, uh, work-related business books. I have subscription to probably about ten magazines, and one of the most depressing things is that I stack them all up every week on the nightstand next to my bed. And all of these are weekly subscriptions, sadly. So I'm always behind. That's what the one thing that you know. I, I look at the, the the five magazines, and then the next the next week the other five are coming, and I haven't even finished one of them. So I wish I could read more. Uh, I, I I also wish I could spend more time with my friends. So but if overall, I'm pretty, pretty so if you if you guys are sending the Fina a deck a pitch book, you should put a nice little book on the cover and just wish her to get some personal time <laughs> exactly. to read it. And exactly. uh, yeah, I'd, I'd like to turn it over where uh, uh, we, we finish with the. Uh, fire chat exercise. So maybe I'm, I'm sure uh, some people want to ask some questions. Um, so last night I was at Better House, and I'm thank you uh, to the to the organizers. I'm sure some of you are here. I, I found a lot of pleasure in answering questions, and I had some great questions. So I hope you guys uh, won't be shy and ask ask questions. We have microphones for people. If not, just raise your hand, and I'll come give you mine. Come on, ask her some questions, man. She's here in the first time in six years. <laughs> Raise your hand. <laughs> All right, we got one right up here in front. Uh, Fabio Grati from AT City Labs Europe. Uh, a question. What is, uh, from your point of view, the most important difference between uh, a European VC and a Silicon Valley VC? <laughs> Good question, because I've heard a lot about this. It is a good question, and, and it's, it's a very tough one for me because I don't want to get in trouble. Um, they are blonde. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't want to get in trouble and say anything uh, negative about my colleagues in, in Europe. Um, I think that it, we, we look at um, what is the biggest difference. So in, in the Valley, there is a standard set of terms 
we call them market terms that we all, I would say, have agreed on, you know, and it's this kind of silent agreement that, um, and so we call our term sheets vanilla term sheets, you know, everybody knows that those are sort of the terms and things happen very quickly if, if you offer uh, an entrepreneur the vanilla term sheets. Um, I think that in Europe, and I understand why they do that, but I think in Europe that there is no, there are no standard term sheets. It's still, I think the, the European VCs um, probably haven't had as, as, as many years of experience. All of them are still trying to figure out their own market and their own customer. So uh, there isn't such thing as standardized set of terms, which makes it very difficult for entrepreneurs to, both for entrepreneurs and VCs, to uh, agree on terms and to move the legal due diligence, the legal process forward. Um, I also think that it's very hard to talk about fair market value or fair, or fair term sheets when you don't have a standard. In the United States, the standard is 10 to 20 percent dilution for the founders. Um, you know, standard is there's always outliers, but standard is for a seed stage company you get anywhere between five to ten million valuation. You know, for another for a Series A company you get five to ten million dollars raised, and again 20 percent dilution. So, so there is just almost like a formula that you apply, and as long as you're within a range, both you as an entrepreneur and the VC feels very, feel very comfortable to, to make the deal happen. I think here it's still a little bit like the Wild West, you know, so everything works as long as the two parties agree to it. And I've seen both sides being burned by that, both entrepreneurs being unhappy about having struck a deal that in retrospect they think is very unfair, and the VCs having felt that um, they, they didn't get what they invested in uh, because, again, the, the standard isn't there. Um, I would say that that's just mostly a, a reflection of a market that's not mature and that hasn't really uh, incorporated all the experiences of the years that the Silicon Valley has had. We actually have two questions here. One is Evo and this lady here, but we're going to let ladies go first, and then Evo's going to follow up. Sorry for taking. Okay, uh, do you have your own formula how to become big? <laughs> no. Uh <laughs> I don't. <laughs> no, I, uh, yeah, I'm sorry. I, I think that, look, I think that uh, we all define our success different in a different way. I think that as long as you're clear about what success means to you, you can probably figure out your own path to get there. For some people, success means a lot of money. I, I've met people like that. For other people, it means having a, a strong family and, you know, raising, raising kids that they're proud of. For others, it means balanced life. Uh, you know, and then there are the people who really want to discover themselves or improve themselves, have, uh, invest in personal growth. So I think that, you know, m my formula uh, to, to become, I don't know, to make it big, I, I've always tried to stay, most importantly, try, uh, have, have tried to stay true to myself. And you know, that's not very easy because there's a lot of noise out there and, and, and sometimes we get flooded by other people's values and we have to constantly remind ourselves what is important to us and i'm sure that's true for you guys as well you know um uh, other people impose their own expectations on us their values they talk about what's important to them and sometimes it's easy to get carried away by by what everybody else talks about and put that first and then we sort of get lost so i think the most challenging the most challenging thing for me and it's probably true for many people out, out here is that uh, we need to remember what, what's important to us, how we define success. And then once you know that and you keep reminding yourself of that, then, then you figure out how to get there and you try to surround yourself by people who have aligned similar values and, and watch from them, learn from them. So for me, it has been very important to surround myself um, with mentors, people that see the world the same way, who have done it before, who are 20 years or, or more older than me and who I want to be like when I grow up. Uh, so uh, learning from them, watching them, uh, the way they live their lives, talking to them, letting, letting them uh, uh, influence me, challenge me, ask tough questions, and be honest with myself has been my way to, to move forward. I don't know if that, that means making it big, but that's how I've tried to live my life and how I continue to, to, uh, to, to, to move forward. Step by step. Step by awesome. step, exactly. <laughs> okay, we got Evo here, he's yeah. got a question. First of all, congratulations on everything you've achieved. A fantastic Thank fire you. chat, and the answer to the last question was great. Uh, my question goes back to business. <laughs> so uh, you said something that Israelis have a very strong competitive advantage in security, uh, but every single geography might have this competitive advantage in something. So how do you guys look at Europe overall? Like, what do you think we can be better at? Yeah. Maybe better even in the States. Maybe sound is one of them. I don't know, travel. 
uh, and also our region here, uh, Bulgaria and the, the surrounding yeah. countries, like what do you think can stand out and what yeah. could be our competitive advantage? Cheers. So USVP as a firm does not invest in Europe and uh, it, is, uh, it is disappointing, but it's a decision that uh, the firm has made and uh, for the right uh, set of reasons, uh, we don't have expertise in the region, we do not have presence in the region and we believe that for early stage venture it's important to be close to the entrepreneur. So in, in th that's why there are venture firms here, including in Bulgaria, that invest in entrepreneurs here. I think that uh, it's hard for me to answer the question of what Europe can be good at because there have been, there has been there have been a number of companies that have done really well. I'll give you an example: Zendesk. I don't know if you guys have heard of it. Zendesk started in Europe and they moved as soon as they got VC money from uh, the United States. They moved to Boston and then subsequently to the Valley. And it's a company in the enterprise uh, customer um, support management space. Spotify, of course, everybody knows it's a company uh, in the um, in the entertainment music industry. Um, I, I think that uh, there, there's a number of gaming companies that have been successful. So I, I don't think that there is one thing. Um, it's really what's important is the idea and, and the team you you put ar put around that idea to implement it, to put it in, uh, uh, give it, give it life. And uh, if you have an exceptional team that in a unique way addresses that um, that idea, that need on the market, you're going to be successful. Now, I think for Bulgaria, I would say one thing for Bulgaria, uh, it, again, again, it's a biased answer here because I'm Bulgarian. I, I, I think about all my friends here, my friends in the Valley as well. I think we're very good technologists. You know, maybe we can also build good uh, entertainment companies and, and you know, the, ne the next Spotify might come from here or the next Angry Bird can come from here. We know what angry means to, especially <laughs> Bulgarians. We can get angry. So, but but you know, it, it, I think we're very good at building deep technology companies because I, I think Bulgaria has unique engineering talent of, um, that can solve complex technical problems, and uh, I think that's very valuable. I think it's very hard to find. That's a significant, sustainable, competitive advantage that we can explore and exploit. And I, and I think we're doing the first step. We have taken the first step because there are a lot of outsourcing shops here. Uh, we are helping the Valley build better companies by building them here and sending them for sales and marketing in the Bay Area. We can continue to do that. And I think that, uh, again, it's a, it's a step, it's a process, and this is the first step. I think the next step is there will be people who, who uh, here who, through that process, will find market needs, they'll, f they'll find problems, they can fix and address. But as long as we stay close to solving tough technical problems, we'll do well. Okay, we, with that, you guys have to wrap it up. So final word from Pavel, and we got to move on to our next panel. Sounds good. Well, thanks for coming. Are you coming back again? Yes, I, I have made a promise to my family, as well as to my friends here, that I will try to come to Bulgaria at least once a year from now on. And I would love to hear from all of you. I know that this was only a 30-minute far, fireside chat uh, conversation, and uh, many of you have, ha have questions that probably weren't answered. I know some of you are shy to, to speak in front of the audience here. So uh, please reach out. I'm here the rest of the day. I'm here tomorrow as well. Uh, my email is dafina at usvp. It's very easy to remember. So uh, if I can help with anything, uh, again, we do not make investments in Europe. That doesn't mean, though, I can't help in other ways. So please, uh, please reach out. Yeah, exactly. Don't ask me for money. <laughs> 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 but uh, uh, advice is always, uh, you know, it's always free. Okay. Big applause. <laughs> awesome. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you.